CEO. Welcome to Cherokee Talks. This session is on Cherokee clothing and our history. My name is Tanya Hogner Weevil, and I'm happy to be out here in this scorching heat to bring you some information about our history. Um, we're at this beautiful one fire field during Cherokee holiday, which is so wonderful to be in person. It's good to see everybody. It's nice to shake hands. It's good to give hugs to some old friends. So I'm glad you could come out today. Today my talk is going to focus on Cherokee clothing throughout our history and our, our historical times. Um, several years ago, I was fortunate to take the Cherokee history course. And through the entire part of the history, my thought was, what are they wearing? What do they look like? What, do they, what kind of houses are they going into? What does their homes look like? Those, all of those social things that uh, would complete a Cherokee picture of our historic families hundreds of years ago. I was tasked by uh, the Cherokee Heritage Center when the new village was being built to clothe the villagers in time-appropriate clothing. And I found out very quick that there is not one source of Cherokee clothing. They're scattered through many sources. So I did essentially a research paper. And so you today are reaping the benefits of my research. So I'm happy to do that. So let's start. Pre-contact clothing. This is um, what we were wearing previous to anybody else seeing us or recording it. And I must start with a, 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 a statement that says, when you read about our history or you know about what we're doing in our prehistoric times, you're seeing that view from someone else's eyes. Someone who doesn't know our culture, doesn't know who we are. So they're outsiders looking in, recording about us. So you take things with a grain of salt. Um, I was very worried about how to do things. I wanted to make it accurate. I wanted to make it correct. And when I got ready to sew, I didn't know what kind of stitch they used to sew. And I fretted about it for a week. And finally in my head I said, do the strongest, most simple stitch you can. That's probably what they would have done. So I followed my heart and my head and began to do things in a common, practical way. As you see on the screen, there is a, a picture of a man in a breech cloth, and it's blue. Where did we get blue? Well, we dyed our leather often. So the breech cloth is a piece of leather or fabric later that goes under the crotch and the flaps uh, fit over a belt around the waist. Um, it is an ingenious item of clothing and it was worn by almost every tribe in the United States during this time period. Everything we had was made from animals or plants. And today, fortunately, we still have plants and animals. And I often ask kids, are you wearing a plant? And they say, no. And I said, do you have on underwear? And they say, yes. And I said, it's probably made out of cotton, which is a plant. So we're still wearing plants and animals today. High tanning and weaving were the most common uh, forms of production. The picture you saw was in a journal, as is uh, the man in the red leggings and the woman with the wrapped skirt. They're from a journal by Von Reck in 1731. So those are the first recorded illustrations of any clothing that I could find. And these are actually of the Yuchi tribe, which was very close and in the southeast next to Cherokees. So I'm assuming that we wore clothes similarly to them. Um, and this is, this is what we wore. Um, you can see the leggings are dyed red. They're, they cover the legs, they come up above the knees, and they have a piece of leather that um, goes up to the waistband and attaches to his belt. The women were topless, as were the men. We had no concept of a shirt until the British brought it to us. But um, the women also had uh, a wrap leather skirt. We also, previous to that, used a fiber from the interior bark of the mulberry tree. <clears throat> 
that fiber was peeled and pounded. We say mulberry bark, but it's actually the interior fibers. It was pulled, pounded, and then woven into a fine, almost like linen cloth, and we use that as a wrap skirt. had feather capes. Of course, we used everything. What besides the, our Alaskan natives who used seal intestines as raincoats, they cleaned the casings of the intestines, stitched them together for waterproof raincoats. To me, that's the most ingenious native item of clothing ever. But feather capes come, make a close second. Those feather capes, the feathers are light, they're waterproof, and they're warm. And so we use the feathers of the birds for capes to clothe us in the winter. We also use those capes as bedding. So we slept on them and covered with them. You can see that it's a, a, la a laborious process. Everything Cherokees did at the time were laborious, was laborious. But what else did we have but time to make the best items of clothing we could for each other? You see the turkey feather cape? The turkey feather was probably one of the most used feathers, but uh, the, the cape the woman's wearing is goose, goose feathers. We cannot use endangered species feathers today, but our ancestors did. So those capes were colorful and beautiful and had a um, luster and sheen to them that we're not able to capture today because we're limited to what we can use. But an ingenious coat, if you will. <coughs> I too ask kids, do we still wear feathers? No, in our hair. No, I say we do. We have down jackets and we love them. And the down, of course, is from the breast of the bird that protects, it's the warmest feather on the bird, so it protects the bird from um, his vital organs. So yeah, we still wear feathers. Match coats or mantles. Now. I have a mantle here that I made for a play, and it typically would have been on wool. This is not wool, but you can see that it's just a long strip of fabric with some beautiful ribbons. It was worn over one shoulder. It actually was tucked in. It was worn over one shoulder and then wrapped around the back and tied here. So it makes a gorgeous garment. Everything we had was wrapped. How smart is that? Did you ever make doll clothes? So you did, right? Out of a wash rag that you stole from your mom? I did. And we didn't have buttons or snaps or Velcro. So we wrapped our dolls in those clothes and cut holes for the arms. That's exactly what Cherokees did. It's an easy way to clothe yourself. So we did this wrapping of the mantle. <clears throat> when we traded for wool, we used the wool as well. But we also had skins. And you can, I don't know if you can see my dolls. I have a bison skin robe and I have a rabbit fur. And the rabbit fur is perfect because it fits my doll. But it wouldn't fit a grown woman. So several rabbit furs were sewn together, not just rabbit. All small, ermine, um, muskrat, all the small critters we used. We also, the picture, the black and white picture shows a bison robe that has been painted with geometric designs on the inside. And fashionably enough, the tail is left on to give it that added pizzazz. Um, the picture in the center is a Creek chief that went to London, but I show this because you can see the, the artist put the luxurious fur. You can see how luxurious the fur was. 
So we, when we tanned hides, sometimes we took the hair off, sometimes we left the hair on. And this is an example of the hair on. And then you see the wool mantles in a painting by Robert Griffin. The, um, they both have uh, the mantle wrap. The red one has no decoration, and the blue one is decorated with ribbon. This is also, this little fellow right here is also showing a mantle. We wore those mantles as soon as we were able to trade for the fabrics. And in 1790, it is recorded that this man was wearing this beautifully draped green emerald silk mantle. So we had access to beautiful silks and fabrics, and we used them. Le leggings. Oh, I can't imagine leggings today. I, I mean in this heat. But when it's snowing and cold, they're beautiful, and they're wonderful, and they're just two legs to cover your own legs. Um, essentially, initially, we made leggings that were side seamed. The seam came on the side, which is the bottom two right pictures. We left a flap. I guess if you got fat, you could let them out a little, or if you got tight. But, um, they were uh, often decorated with bird feathers, talons, different things that they found that they liked. They could decorate their flaps. A lot of people think we did fringe, and we did do fringe, but our fringe was short. It was only about an inch long, and I've been told that it helps repel the water if they get wet. The fringe helps repel the water. And you see the red leggings that you saw in the Von Reg picture again. Those are um, dyed. I have a pair of side seam leggings. Um, and these are decorate. Oh, that's the breach, sorry. Here's the, here's the leggings. And you can see that the flap goes on the outside. And these are slightly decorated with some geometric beadwork. These were made for a play, so they come up high because today our men are very modest. They don't want to show more than they have to. But this, these are leggings. This is the actual size of a breech cloth that a man would have worn. So it would have gone in between his legs and come up. So you see the flap would be very short. Today when I have men dress, they want a long breech cloth, they don't want a short breech cloth. But our ancestors were very comfortable in a short breech cloth. After we traded for wool in the mid-1700s, we then uh, began to make center seam market, uh, leggings. And they were made of wool. So you see this picture, the black and white picture of the center seam moccasins. So this is my work. I made a pair of center seam mock, uh, leggings that the foot sort of fits over the shoe like a spat. And the uh, ties come up to the front. And these are heavily decorated with silk ribbon and some beadwork. So, um, this is a style of the kind of uh, leggings our men would have worn mid-18th century. Moccasins are shoes. They were made of one piece of leather. They were fitted around the foot and puckered or pulled the top seam so that um, it, it fits the foot. Um, I don't know if you can see, but here's a pair. Actually, it's a pair and a pair. Um, you can see they have a small flap, and the center seam is puckered. We also had a habit of wearing the cuff up around our ankle, and it was tied with a leather thong. And we also tied around the arch of the foot to help hold it on. 
If we were able, we made these from deer skin, I mean elk skin, because deer skin wears out real fast. Thus the hole in the bottom of the moccasin. Don't tell. <clears throat> After we acquired beads, silk ribbon, velvets, fabrics, we then began to decorate our shoes. And I can tell you, just like today, Cherokees preferred bare feet to shoed feet. So, um, moccasins weren't worn very often. Virginia Stroud once said, Cherokees walked barefoot to the next village and they put on their shoes when they got there. So, um, these, however, were the style of shoes we wore. You can see in the bottom photograph of the big leg of the moccasin. It did fit over the leg and it was tied with a flap, tied with the thongs to stay on the legs to give added warmth and protection from walking through the brush. Beautiful, huh? Before we get into 19th century, I have to go backwards. I failed to show you. Um, this is a uh, deer skin, and it's a cheat deer skin wrap skirt. It was made for a play, and so I have elastic in the middle because today we use what we have, right? Good old Cherokee elastic. But this is deer skin, and you see it's beautiful and white. It's made like a faux skirt where it appears as if it's wrapped because there's the flap that comes back on the skirt. When I was beginning to dress the villagers, I realized that our women could not be topless. We're very modest today. Well, by law we're modest. So I read and read and read one article that said the women for a particular ceremony dressed in a toga style top that showed several inches of their midriff. So I fashioned the one shoulder top to cover the breast and to still show the midriff. So that was my interpretation of my research. As men um, <clears throat> progressed and, and the British brought us woolen goods, linen, silks. We took those up and used those as um, anybody would. They're beautiful fabrics. And so what I love about our fashion is that we did not change our style. We changed the fabric. So from a deerskin breach, we went to a wool breach. From a deerskin wrap skirt, we went to a wool wrap skirt. So I want to show you. This is a wrap skirt. Now how hard would that be? You're thinking, I could make that. And it literally wraps around the woman. And um, you can see my um, leather got on it, sorry. And it wraps in the front. This was a beautifully mobile garment. You could do anything you wanted in it. You could sit cross-legged, you could climb trees, you could chase your man. Whatever you needed to do, you could do in a wrap skirt. Well, because I am very particular about how my clothes look on other people, I realized they could never tie it where the stripes of the ribbon matched. So, I made the faux wrap skirt. It is one piece, it has elastic in the top, it's stitched, thank you, it's stitched on the side, and no matter what you do, those beautiful ribbons stay right in line with each other. So this is for our women today, and this, uh, this is a wool skirt with silk ribbon. So it's made with correct materials, but just with a 21st century mind for um, convenience. 
our women then began to <coughs> make clothing from the fabrics we were given, the linen fabrics we were given, and we fashioned our fabrics after the American women that we saw. By this time, we're uh, introduced to other fashions and other people, and so we start dressing like they do. Um, you can see the trade shirt and the woman with a, the little jacket on. Those are very commonly worn by Cherokee women. Let me talk to you about the trade shirt. The trade shirt is still worn today. Uh, I make several of them. Um, but they were brought to us by the British. Because we did not have that concept of collar sleeves, uh, cuffs, cutting, putting together. Everything we had, we just wrapped on us. Wrap skirts, wrap reach cloth, wrap mantles. So when they brought us the shirt, it was unique to us. So the trade shirt is a long piece of fabric with a hole cut in the middle for your head, two straight pieces of fabric on each side, folded in half, the sleeve and the seam are stitched, and you have a shirt. Easy, simple. Here is a picture. It was made big, it was gathered, and it's really loose. The sleeves are heavily gathered, so there's no constriction. And the beautiful gusset, if you don't know what a gusset is, I'm happy to tell you. It's a square piece that fits under the arm that gives you full range of motion. We carried that to the tear dress, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But this is the trade shirt. When we got um, printed fabric, guess what? We made trade shirts out of printed fabric. So um, we were actually quite fashionable in my opinion. Let me talk a minute about ornamentation. Gorgets, as this Oki says, gorget. It's gorget if you're speaking in French, which is where the word comes from. It's for throat, and it is actually the last piece of armor worn as a military uniform when armor was the military uniform. However, Cherokees, centuries before, had ornamentation of necklaces that we today call gorgets. They were made of shell, they were beautifully carved, they often told a story, or they had some significant meaning. When the British and the French brought gorgets, they gave them as a um, symbol, oh, I'm, I, uh, I'm off with the slide, I'm sorry. Let me go to gorgeous. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, they were a sign of allegiance. So because we looked alike to the French, their guide, their, their buddy, they gave the gorget to so they could identify him. Once they saw it, once the other uh, people saw it, they wanted one too. So we have this series of gorgets that we use. You can also see some carved shell gorgets, which are still made today. They're, go they're, they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. So um, <clears throat> these um, gorgets are still used. Sometimes they're uh, hung from each other, two or three in a bunch. Um, if you saw the State of the Nation yesterday, our chief had on a gorgeous copper gorget. Um, so we still use this as a symbol of our ancestry's dress. Now let me go back. Quickly, I know, I, I, there's so much to tell you. I could talk to you all day. Um, the ears were split. They were wrapped with leather till they healed, and then they were bound with uh, silver or copper, which gave uh, this great bounce to the men's head. Only men did this. So that was one form of ornamentation. Tattooing was done. It was, the skin was pricked and soot from the fire, soot from the ashes was rubbed into uh, the tattoos. 
they were of stars, crescents, scrolls, um, things of nature. And they also indicated valor in war and um, sometimes were done for the beauty. Men and women were tattooed. I'm not a tattoo expert, but I know we did it. On the bandolier bags. When we, in the early 1700s, at a, gra at a archaeological dig of a Cherokee town, early 1700s, there were um, thousands of seed beads found. Seed beads are those little tiny beads that you see used in these bandolier bags. Beading became the women's passion, and they became very good at it. The bandolier bag is specific to several southeastern tribes, Cherokees among them. What indicates a Cherokee bandolier bag is there are usually two different patterns on each of the straps, and there's almost always a triangular tip to the flap. It's not rarely is it fully beaded. It is the background of the wool shows through to indicate different patterns. And thus we have the bandolier bag. Those are still being made today, thank goodness, because they're beautiful works. Not only did we bead bandolier bags, but we also beaded sashes. And sashes just came across the chest, fastened at the hip. But what's interesting about sashes is they always had this, I call it a double spiral design. On almost every sash, the beads are white, and this design is used. There is a particular stitch you can see in the color picture, uh, the close-up, where it's a lacy edge. So that's a particular beadwork stitch that causes that to show that, uh, that ornamentation. We also had belts. Belts were beaded and worn. The streamers were made so long that they wrapped twice around the man and were tied. They were usually finger woven with beads woven into them. So another laborious, beautiful set of works by our Cherokee women and men. The hunting jacket is probably one of the most notable uh, jackets. I was going to bring one today, but I lent them all out to be in the parade and different things, so I didn't have one to bring. The hunting jacket is made from the frontiersman's frock. You see the frock on the side. It's double caped, and it's a simple design, <coughs> straight. When our women begin to <coughs> when our women begin to weave which we did in the early 1800s after Thomas Jefferson gave us looms and spinning wheels. We wore these, wove these beautiful striped patterns. The pattern, the jacket you see laying out is at the Oklahoma Historical Society. It is the very jacket that Charles Banks Wilson used to create the infamous picture of Sequoia wearing the hunting jacket. It is complete with velvet, flaps and the velvet edging and the velvet collar. Almost always was there red fringe around the collar. <clears throat> this garment was a sign of diplomacy. Emmett Starr wrote that after the Trail of Tears in the early 1840s, any man wearing this garment was approachable and helpful. So I thought that was pretty cool that the garment alone indicated that someone was ready and willing to help. We're starting to assimilate to the larger society. So these are about the same time frame. The picture on, with the uh, man sitting is a hunting jacket. And at the same time, we have our Cherokee delegates, or our Cherokee leaders, dressing almost completely uh, um, assimilated. Now to the tear dress. Um, uh, what's the time? Two 
Cherokee tear dress. It's probably the most commonly recognizable dress. No other tribe dresses like we do, our women. There's a story behind the tear dress. We use it as for our ambassadors. Miss Cherokee, Junior Miss Cherokee, um, several of our council women, and a lot of people uh, use the tear dress. I'm not a powwow person, but I was at the powwow trying to get out of the parking lot, and I heard them say Cherokee tear dress as a contest category. So evidently now we're using it in our powwow circle. The tear dress is ingenious. And I can tell you all the secrets about the tear dress. To our knowledge, well, before I say that, I have to give most honorable credit to the king, the master of the tear dress, and that's Wendell Cochran. Wendell Cochran taught me, was my mentor, and taught me very, very many things about the tear dress. The tear dress has kind of a long history, but it circles around the Trail of Tears drama that was held at the Cherokee Heritage Center in the late 60s and 70s. The tear dress is a relatively modern garment Virginia Stroud was the first Cherokee to wear a tear dress. She was entering a, a contest, I can't remember if it was Miss Indian Oklahoma or Miss Indian USA, of which she won both, as well as being a Miss Cherokee. <clears throat> W.W. Keeler, who was the chief, said, we have to find a garment that represents Cherokee. Because Virginia was raised by a Kiowa family, had close ties to a Kiowa family, she was wearing a Kiowa buckskin, which was honorable that they would allow her to do that. But it wasn't Cherokee. So a group of ladies, a committee was formed. And this, my friends, is when Cherokee women, all women, sewed. Every stitch of clothing you had, typically, your mother made. And certainly in the 1800s, that was true. So these women were, were expert seamstresses, and one lady said, there's a trunk that's reported to have come over on the Trail of Tears, and in that trunk is a dress. I will bring it. She did, they opened the trunk, and this, they pulled this dress out, and that's what the tear dress was made from. However, the tear dress in itself, as us hard-working Cherokee women are, was utilitarian in nature. Today, it is a showpiece. It is a, uh, a special garment. But let me give you the notions about a tear dress. <clears throat> Beautiful red tear dress. And to be honest, you have to be this big for it to look good on you. Have to be tall and skinny. But us heavy women, we like them too, so we wear them anyway. The tear dress is made from a yoke. This, the, the shoulder part is the yoke. The bodice is fully gathered. The waistband, the skirt, and the flounce, which is this bottom ruffle. Now this is a full-size tear dress. Our ancestors wore a three-quarter length sleeve so your sleeves did not get dirty, washing dishes, picking corn, planting crops. The skirt was also three-quarter, meaning it came below the knee. It didn't drag in the fields. It didn't get dirty quite as quick. The dress buttons down the front. The buttoning in the front allows for mothers to nurse their babies, and let me tell you, in the late 1800s, if you were wealthy, your clothes buttoned in the back because you had someone to dress you. If you were of more meager means, you dressed yourself. So you buttoned yourself. So that's the bodice. The bodice is full in the front and the back. It's gathered onto a waistband. This allows the shirt not to come untucked from the skirt. 
so you didn't have to tuck in your clothing. It was already stabilized by this band. The skirt is full and the flounce is even fuller. That allows you to sit cross leg, climb trees, chase your man, whatever you needed to do. So it was a utilitarian garment. I'll tell you a fast story. I ha when I worked at the Heritage Center, we did a lot of classes. And I had a lady call and she says, will you help me make a tear dress? And in my head I was like, oh, I've taught classes. It's, it's several days to teach. It's a laborious effort to make a tear dress. And when she got there, she had Lou Gehrig's disease. And she knew that she was going to not be able to sew, not be able to drive. She drove from Eufaula to Tahlequah. And she told me her grandmother wore this style of dress continuously. And that she had her Sunday dress and she had her everyday dress. And so that day, she made the skirt, I made the top. And when she left, she said, these are my funerary clothes. So, the tear dress is meaningful to Cherokee people and to Cherokee women. And it certainly was to her, whose grandmother wore that style of dress. I have never seen a photograph of this style of dress in the time period. I've seen a Mother Hubbard kind of dress that has that yoke and a fully gathered uh, bodice. I've seen babies wear the yoke and a big full skirt, but I've never seen photographs of our Cherokee women in this dress. Nonetheless, we have adapted the Cherokee tear dress as ours, and well, and rightfully so. So the tear dress is ours. That's my spiel on the tear dress. The ribbon shirt, I'm often asked. The ribbon shirt is not Cherokee in nature. However, like we have since time immemorial, we have adapted, we've taken, we liked it, we wanted it, we thought it looked good on us, so we wore it. That's what we do with the ribbon shirt. Um, it is uh, used as a Cherokee item of clothing. We've adapted it, and I don't know that we'll ever scrub the, the ribbon shirt. So it's part, of our, it's part of our world. Today, we wear anything we want. Cherokee clothing today, in 200 years when they study Cherokee holiday 2022, they're going to say, T-shirts and shorts and slides. That's the Cherokee dress, right? But we learn from our ancestors. We wear whatever we like. We have become snobbish about only wearing Cherokee. Our ancestors, if they were given a gift by a Chickasaw or a Mohawk or a Lakota, they wore it. They were not restricted to Cherokee only. Today, we're a little bit standoffish about it. This is what I say. If it's a gift to you, wear it. If it's something you love, wear it. It's yours. It's your, uh, it's you expressing your likes and dislikes. So, with that being said, I want to encourage everyone who has a sewing machine in their closet to get it out. I want you to go home and thread that up and oil that machine and get it started again. Teach your grandchildren. I think I was uh, named National Treasure in 2012. That was 10 years ago. There have been other textile winners, but not seamstresses. Teach your kids how to sew. Start sewing again. It won't be long before the machine, the stitching, this is lost to our people and we don't want that to happen. So learn to make tear dresses and take some of my orders. I will give them to you. I'm often asked. So <clears throat> I am happy to entertain any questions that you might have about Cherokee clothing. 
Yes. It's called a tear dress because the fabric is torn. They, you'll read articles that say Cherokee women didn't have scissors. We had scissors. We traded for them. We actually had flint rocks that were sharper than scissors. So we didn't have any trouble cutting things. The tear dress, I fail to say, is all rectangles and squares. To this day, I tear the fabric. It tears straight, it's quick, and it's spot on. So that's why it's called a tear dress. You can call it a tear dress, relating it to the Trail of Tears. It was a little past the Trail of Tears time period, but who knows. Any other questions? That's considered regalia today. He asked if there were pow what about powwow clothing. That's considered regalia, and it typically follows the tribe, uh, uh, maybe a ceremony or their tribal dress um, that's used today in powwow cl uh, clothing. Cherokees were not powwow people in the beginning. And when I say that, I mean like the 1940s and 50s. Um, but our, our men do dance, and sometimes they, they dress with other tribal uh, clothing. Who made them? They both. Today, both men and women make that powwow regalia. And both men and women make Cherokee clothes. I know men that make tear dresses. I know women that bead. I know men that bead. So um, it's, it's not relegated to one sex or the other. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Where do you get patterns? From my brain? Um, there are no really good uh, tear dress patterns. I've been working on one for several years, but the way Wendell taught me is that you make the tear dress to fit the woman. I love making tear dresses. This is for, uh, I think she's 13. She's even. Her front waist is the same as her back waist. Older women, we're crooked. Our bellies stick out, our butts stick out. So you have to make adjustments so the skirt hangs even. You've seen skirts on women that hike in the back. So we make concessions for that. So there's some alterations and some do fixing and doing when you make a tear dress. You might be broader in the front than you are the back. So there are little idiosyncrasies to that pattern. There is not a good tear dress pattern, I'm sorry to say. Maybe in the future I'll have one. Do I have a website? I do not. I, I, I do not. <laughs> but I do work at the Cherokee Nation. I'm the supervisor for the Cultural Resource Center. And part of my job is to instruct and teach about Cherokee culture. And that includes clothing. That's why my dolls, I take these to school, schools to show children. And as a national treasure, it is my duty to teach and pass on what I know. So if you want to get in touch with me, check the Cherokee Nation directory. I'm there. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. Bandolier bag. Is it the Jackson bag? Yes. Those those works were uh, that she asked. Is the bandolier bag uh, used as a gift for diplomacy? And it was. It absolutely was. Um, we gifted each other, each other tribes as well as. Um, other people 
um, our allies and our enemies. We gifted um, our bandolier bags and other finery, moccasins and that sort of thing. Where that started, when trade began, when trade began, we began to exchange. And we saw that giving a gift sometimes eased military tensions. And so that's kind of where that started, early 1700s. What about wampum? Wampum is made from the quahog shell that's found on the East Coast. The wampum belts that are used in our ceremonies today are, were gifts to us. Cherokees did not use wampum. They did not manufacture wampum, but they were gifted to us and we used them as gifts. Yeah, this is a wampum pattern from Iroquois. Iroquois. Um, figures and stories were woven into wampum belts that typically uh, uh, encourage peace and diplomacy with each other and goodness and kindness. Yes, ma'am. She asked if copper was a gift. I couldn't quite hear. Copper. Oh, is copper, is copper significant in our history? It is. When we go back, oh, thousands of years to the Spyro era, copper was manufactured and pounded into plates and used as ornamentation. We were part of that Spyro group and we carried that with us. When we had access to copper, which had to be uh, uh, manufactured in any kind of a sheet, then it was used. Spyro mounds that early very early. And so today we latch onto that copper because it was part of our ancient history of ornamentation. And so we use copper today as sort of a sacred metal, if you will. It's not necessarily sacred, but, but it's something that we can relate to. Where we get the beads? Oh, the beads were traded for. They came from Europe. They're glass beads, they were manufactured in Europe and they were brought to us as trade items. And we latched onto them quick, quickly. Not only did the Cherokees use beadwork, but all of those tribes in the Southeastern. You'll see gorgeous uh, beadwork from all of those. Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw. We all, we all really enjoyed the beads. I'll take a final question if you have one. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. And um, happy Cherokee clothing wearing. Thank you.